When we look back on the past five years or so, we can see a conflict between two contradicting trends. One of them is China becoming one of the most important, or some people would say most important destinations for foreign investment, foreign business, and very specifically for this video, expats, foreigners arriving in China for work. On the other hand, China's international relations with some of its most important top trading partners has become worse during the past five years. It started with the trade war between the United States and China, but then it went on with similarly deteriorating relationships with other important trading partners, including Canada, Australia, South Korea, and even India. It is in this context that Chinese authorities published a paper about the number and population trends of foreigners in China. The data in the paper come from the 2020 census, but first of all, we don't have any newer information. And secondly, I think this paper points at a number of very important trends when it comes to what we can expect to foreigners living and working in China and international companies who rely on these people, not only as workforce, but also as consumers. I thought it would be a good idea to comment on some of the insights that I can find in this paper. And I would like to do this through three important questions. First of all, where is China and where is multinational business in China when it comes to the number of foreigners in the country? Secondly, where do China as an international business destination and where do international businesses in China want to be in the next couple of years? And then finally, if there is a gap between where we are and where we want to be, how to close this gap, how to get there. While I'm doing that, I would like to refer back to a speech I made in Shanghai in 2019 on a very similar topic. And I would like to do that because I think it's useful to see a comparison between the 2019 situation, which is the last pre-pandemic year, and where we are now. First, where is China? And where are foreign firms in China right now? If you want to look at the status of foreigners in China, the last couple of years have been a crazy roller coaster. Even five years ago, the HSBC Expat Explorer Survey highlighted China as one of the most attractive destinations for talented and ambitious expats in the world. And then China engaged in a number of trade wars with some of its top trading partners, United States, Australia, Canada, South Korea, and more, which obviously raised the risk of investing in China, doing business in China, and even moving to China. We thought our biggest problems were trade wars at that time, but then came the pandemic, and that in itself created a even wilder roller coaster for foreigners. So at the beginning, as the pandemic originated in China, many experts tried to leave. In less than half a year, it seems that China is the only relatively open market in the world. And then a lot of expats actually wanted to relocate to China. Now, during the zero COVID policies in China, again, we can see a lot of foreigners, a lot of expats leaving. So where does it leave us? Some people talk of an expat exodus from China, which basically implies that virtually all foreigners will leave the country. Now, Let's put aside those people who think that China needs no foreigners, because obviously the People's Republic of China still has great ambitions to become an investment, a research and development and academic hub in the world, which is impossible without a healthy relationship with the outside world, which includes a healthy relationship with foreigners inside of the country. Instead, if we want to look at the other side of the argument from the expat exodus narrative, let's look at those people who say that foreigners would still like to come to China, except now at the moment they cannot because the zero COVID policies make it very difficult to enter. First of all, if you look at the survey results, the first thing that you are going to see that there are huge ups and huge downs in terms of the number of people entering China and living in China from different countries. You will also notice that most of the downs are economically advanced rich nations, which are traditionally the sources of the so-called expat population in China and who are also China's main trading partners. 
the nations that are more and more represented in China's international population are usually developing nations, typically in the Asian continent. Basically, what is happening is a replacement of people we would normally call expats with people that we would normally call immigrants. Both kind of new arrivals in the country actually come for opportunities, but expats typically arrive to fulfill high-end job positions and most of their costs, including their salaries, relocation costs, insurance, healthcare, and even education for their kids are covered in one way or another by their employers. Foreigners from the countries that serve as main sources of the new wave of immigration into China typically arrive as students or people who look for work. Interestingly, many of them arrive in China thanks to state subsidies, basically student stipends or talent programs to, for example, Belt and Road countries. Now, we have to look at another interesting dynamic, is that if we look at the numbers of people who come from developed economies that serve as China's top trading partners, many of them may actually be fewer than it seems, because many of those people are actually Chinese naturalized citizens, which means they lived abroad for a number of years, acquired a foreign passport and then re-entered the country as foreigners. You see, China doesn't allow dual citizenship. So if somebody born in the People's Republic takes on a new passport, they actually have to get rid of their Chinese citizenship. And next time when they enter the country, they enter as bona fide foreigners. There are tens of thousands of people every year in each of these major economies acquiring citizenship there. So the numbers can be quite different from what we see here on paper. This is a quick, but I think fairly reliable summary of the situation. So let's look at where both China as an uh, international business destination and foreign firms in China would like to be. Now, people these days, they disagree on many things. But there is one thing that everybody agrees on, is that China's future is absolutely crucial for the global economy. Recent research suggests that some of the biggest multinational companies in the world are heavily exposed to presence in China, getting anything from 10% up to one third or even more of their income from the Chinese market. The Chinese government also puts a lot of energy into outreach programs such as the Belt and Road Initiative or the Thousand Talents Program, which is specifically targeting international high-end talent and Chinese returnees with foreign passports. Even as China's international relations disputes increase the risk of investing and operating in the country, and zero COVID makes it virtually impossible to resume normal operations there, Beijing has introduced several new measures to attract foreign talents after the country eventually reopens. One of the topics that I looked at in my 2019 speech was whether it was easy or difficult to do business in China. This is crucially important because obviously international talent tries to go to places where their chances of success are relatively high, as well as their standard of living. Now, China has never been an easy place to do business in. And one of the great ways to illustrate this is the so-called World Bank Ease of Doing Business Index. When China entered the uh, World Bank's ranking of places for doing business, it started from a very low position. It was uh, roughly at the same level as Oman because of its ambitions to turn into a service and high value added technology hub. Beijing made very conscious efforts to figure out how the World Bank Ease of Doing Business Index works and adjusting the relevant economic indicators in order to gain a higher position in the ranking. After 2019, when they rolled out this program, actually China made spectacular successes, ascending from the level of Oman and many other fairly poor and fairly economically underdeveloped countries to the level of countries like France and Spain. However, it very soon also turned out that the kind of lobbying and influencing that the Chinese government used in order to improve the country's ranking by the World Bank, they sometimes used questionable methodologies. So finally, not only because of China, but also um, influencing by a number of other World Bank member states, such as Saudi Arabia, the World Bank decided to discontinue the index last year in 2021. 
So in the coming years, we are not going to have such a straightforward index of comparing countries in terms of uh, ease or difficulty of doing business. But there are a number of other ways to looking at the issue. One of them is the number of foreigners in a given country. Because talented expats, they usually like to go to places which has a vibrant international community, not only for uh, convenience, making friends and so on, but also because that's where they can find the services, anything from food, education, healthcare that they need in order to live in a place where usually they typically they don't speak the local language and where as a typical expat, they would stay for a relatively short period of three to five years. Now, in international comparison, there have never been a lot of foreigners in China. You see, the Chinese government only conducts a full census of the population every 10 years. So, for example, between 2010 and 2020, the international economic planning community relied on the 2010 census. Now, uh, in 2010, there were about 750,000 foreigners in the country, but the assumption was that uh, this number grows together with the GDP growth. So just before the 2020 census, the general assumption was that there were around a million foreigners in China. Even a million of foreigners in China in a population of 1.5 billion would have represented about 0.07% of the population. Where does that place China? Usually in countries that are highly exposed to international commerce and business, about 10% of the population is non-native. Then as we descend on the list of countries, anything less than 1% is supposed to be quite isolated. So as you can see, that 0.07% based on 1 million foreigners puts China right at the bottom of the list. And then because of the 2020 census, we found out that the estimation of a million foreigners in China was quite optimistic. That census found out that there were about 850,000 foreigners in China. And that was before the pandemic. So we can expect that number to be even lower now. And that decrease actually fits into a general trend because although we don't have the World Bank's ease of doing business index, but if we look at polling, for example, by chambers of commerce, international chambers of commerce in China, the general consensus is that doing business in China is becoming harder, has become harder in the last couple of years. Finally, let's look at where is international business in China going from here? Of course, it's hard to tell the future. It's a little bit harder in China than in many other countries. But let's look at a couple of general trends here. Now, you must know that as a coach, as a consultant, as a trainer, I usually work for executives of multinational companies or entrepreneurs who have interest in doing business in China. So my advice goes primarily to them. But others could be quite interested as well, including students who would like to go to China, people who would like to find a job in China or who are startup owners and they are considering entering the China market. Although the news that I brought you at the beginning of this video are quite gloomy, but in business, that's not all bad news because the way business works is profit comes from risk. So the bigger the problems, the more opportunities there are. Every single problem can be looked at on the other side as a business opportunity. From the census results, we can see that although what we call expats, basically high-end employees, mainly of multinational companies coming to China is a shrinking group. Their numbers are dropping significantly. But on balance, the number of foreigners in China is not dropping that fast. We don't have numbers since uh, 2020. And especially we don't know how the zero COVID policies influence the overall numbers. But generally speaking, the uh, immigration from countries like Pakistan and Myanmar Thailand and so on would probably make up for the numbers that China loses from nations like the United States, Germany, Japan and so forth. But you can also immediately see that this kind of population trend is in conflict with China's ambitions to become a hub of high value added activities such as investment, research and development and high tech manufacturing for top global market. You see, Myanmar and Pakistan are great sources of labor and the gratitude of the people who entered China thanks to government scholarships or talent programs is good for China's soft powers. But China will not be able to replicate the success story of the past two decades with economic cooperation 
with countries that we usually call the global south, although I personally hate that term because most of those countries are not located on the southern hemisphere. However, if you want to look at opportunities that this trend creates, you can notice something interesting. You see, while the number of foreigners from the countries that represent China's top trading partners is going down, but the volume of business is actually going up. Even during pandemic times, inward investment actually increased. International trade figures have also been doing well. Again, the latest figures from 2022, the influence of zero COVID might alter this trend a little bit, but I think in the long run, the volume of business between China and the rest of the world will keep on increasing. Fewer people taking care of more business means there is more opportunity for people who have the curiosity, the risk appetite and the experience to be successful expert managers, expert entrepreneurs in China. Now, experts do not expect China to fully recover its international mobility of investment, goods, services and people very soon. But there might be another opportunity because of this. Foreigners leaving China is just part of the story. The same difficulties, the same challenges that I mentioned to you, they hit local businesses, local business people, just as hard as expats and foreigners, which means it's not only foreigners who leave China, but also successful and affluent Chinese people as well. As Chinese people travel less, the Great Firewall makes it harder to obtain data from the outside. That creates the opportunity of doing business with China, but not in China. Look again at the chart showing the outflow of rich people from each of these countries. And then think about where do they go? Successful Chinese businesses are often re-establishing themselves primarily in Southeast Asia, but also to another extent in Europe, North America, Middle East and Africa. People who run those businesses are mainly well-traveled Chinese people, but also a lot of foreigners who used to be based in China. They know the country, they speak the language, they have access to China's closed internet ecosystem behind the Great Firewall, or if they don't, they have networks, they have employees, they have agents who can get that information for them and who can communicate with China on their behalf. We can expect China's internal market to recover much faster than China's mobility with the rest of the world. And these outside islands of successful Chinese entrepreneurs, successful Chinese companies all over the world will be a great opportunity for international managers, international executives, investors and entrepreneurs to interact indirectly with the Chinese markets through these well-connected people. So in other words, doing business with China will not necessitate actually being in China. There is going to be a growing infrastructure of well-connected, well-informed people who can indirectly help you do business with China. I hope this information was useful. I'm going to paste the link into the description of each of the information resources that I used in this video. And I will also add the link in case you're interested where you can follow the progress of my upcoming book, Dragon Suit, The Golden Age of Expatriate Executives in China.